sort of. Can you move your camera up a little bit? Because okay, I don't know what's going on here. Um, I can't see myself. Okay, here. Yeah, you're hard. you're good. Yes, now we can see your your face. Okay, I'd like to see myself too. <laughs> Uh, let me see. Thank you. Yeah, I can see you, but I can't see me either. Is there a way to see yourself? I, I guess go to the corner of the view. Side by side I, gallery. If you do I'm gallery and see that the top right, Margo, if you push view and then do gallery, gallery and then. Um, are you right. on my iPad? That's different, I think. Um, yeah. Let's see. Because at first yeah, I, I, don't have have that. I don't have that view either on my iPad. I'm, I'm with Margo. Hi y'all. Hi yeah. everyone. I usually don't have this trouble on my iPad. I can usually see everything. So maybe it's the view that you have because it should be the if you go to the side by side view, you might on your iPad you might be able to see the speaker on the right. Wow. Okay, now we can't see you at all. Okay, now that's better. Okay, so we're um, we're at six oh one. Is it okay to admit everyone? Yes. Okay. Sure. All right, here we go. Welcome and thank you for joining us at the Career Institute North meeting that will focus mostly on zoning. Um, si quieres escuchar esta presentación en español, por favor, vaya al icono del mundo que se encuentra en la parte inferior de su pantalla y pulse en él para comenzar la interpretación en español. If you have any questions, please write them the chat and we will get you um, answers towards the end of the meeting. Now I would like to introduce um, Jean Laswell, who's principal of the Career Institute North, who will tell us more about the, um, the project. Good evening. Welcome to the community meeting discussion about zoning for the Dallas ISD Career Institute North. Thank you for taking time to be here for this presentation. I am Jean Laswell, the Senior Site Administrator and Principal for Career Institute North. Tonight, we will review information about the new facility, its purpose and design, followed by a question and answer session at the end. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dallas ISD District 1 Trustee, Edwin Flores. Thank you, Jean, and it's great uh, to be here and thanks everybody for joining. Uh, this meeting was supposed to happen a couple of weeks ago, but uh, thanks to Ice Mageddon, we got uh, pushed back. So thank everybody for being here. Uh, thank uh, Council Member Gates and uh, Planning and Zoning Member uh, Margo. Uh, she, they're, they're both on the line. Uh, so I will turn it over uh, back to Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. And as he mentioned with us tonight, we have Margo Murphy from the City Planning Commission and Jennifer Gates from the City Council District 13. Hi. Next Good slide. Evening. Good evening, I'm Jennifer Gates. I'm your Dallas City Council member for District 13. Um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Flores, for, for being here tonight. This presentation is being conducted by DIST. Um, I'm here to listen in on the presentation as well um, as hear the community input. Uh, my commissioner, Margo Murphy's on, on board as well. I know she's been attending some previous meetings related to um, this zoning change for this uh, property. So we're here to listen to you um, and advocate for you and make sure this project's gonna fit into the neighborhood properly. Um, so with that, um, but again, we're about land use. Um, at, at, you know, DISD owns this property. I'm going to let make sure questions about the uh, the institute itself or how it will function um, is going to be geared um, at, at uh, Trustee Flores as well as the DISD staff that's on board. Uh, but we're we're here because it is a zoning case, and we want to hear your input related to um, the land use. 
So with that, I'll turn it back. Thank you. And thank you for having me this evening. Okay. Dallas ISD has planned four career institutes to serve students, one in each of the four quadrants of the district, north, south, east, and west. Career Institute North opened in August of 2019 and is currently housed in a temporary location, a 70,000 square foot warehouse where we serve five Dallas ISD high school campuses, Conrad High School, Hillcrest High School, North Dallas High School, Thomas Jefferson High School, and W.T. White High School. We currently serve approximately 500 freshmen and sophomores, but will outgrow our facility, <clears throat> excuse me, within two years. In four years, Career Institute North will serve 3,200 students, but only 800 will be at the facility at any one time, since students will be scheduled over four different time periods on the A day, B day schedule. Students travel to our facility by school bus from their home campus. We do not allow students to drive themselves. Our current facility is located in Farmers Branch and does not meet our travel time needs. Career and technical education classes like those offered at the Career Institutes must provide instruction for an average of 45 minutes a day or 90 minutes every other day on the AB day schedule to meet Texas Education Agency requirements to receive additional funding which supports these classes. To meet that instructional minute time, the travel time to our facility must be within a 20 minute drive of all the campuses we serve. So our current facility is much too far north for several of our campuses, but this site, as you see on the map, meets the 20 minute drive time very well. The purpose of the Career Institutes is to provide Dallas students with the opportunity to learn about a career field of their interest and earn industry recognized certifications that will lead to post-secondary programs in the field and or lead to employment in high demand, livable wage jobs right out of high school. Students participate in four or more courses in each career pathway, earning one or more certifications each year. In their junior and or senior year, students participate in internships or apprenticeships with our industry partners. Then after graduation, they have opportunities to gain full or part-time employment and move on to further their skills at Dallas College or another post-secondary institution. Each day, students arrive at their home campus, then travel by bus to our location where they attend two 90-minute career-based classes, then have lunch in our cafeteria and board the bus to return to their home campus for the remainder of their schedule and any after-school activities. Students come either in the morning or in the afternoon sessions each day. Let's review the career pathways that we offer. In the construction area, we currently offer architecture, interior design, carpentry, electrical and solar technology, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning technology, plumbing technology. We also currently offer aviation flight, cybersecurity and software development, and mechatronics, also known as industrial robotics. In the new facility, we will pre prepare frontline healthcare workers through pathways such as patient care technician, EKG technician, phlebotomy technician, and emergency medical technician. Other pathways that will be included in the new facility will include firefighting, automotive technology, and welding. Next slide, please. We have already secured partnerships with more than 40 businesses to support career institutes and our district CTE program has over 200 business partners to assist the career institutes. The Dallas business community has been extremely supportive and we receive new requests for partnerships every week. Next slide. I'd also like to share with you what a day is like for one of our cybersecurity students, Janet Rivas. Okay, looks like we're not getting any sound there, so we're gonna just move on. I know many of you may be concerned about traffic flow. We do not allow students to walk or drive to our facility, so traffic will really be very minimal with only our staff vehicles and the buses that transport our students. 
To further help with traffic flow, bus arrivals and uh, departures, we have staggered those during a 20 minute period. So they don't arrive all at once or depart all at once. Arrivals happen between nine to 920. Then there is a midday departure and arrival period that occurs between 1230 to one. And finally an end of day departure between 350 to 410. That design will be, uh, excuse me, the design that will be presented this evening has been carefully planned to preserve the original building front. Additions have been coordinated to blend seamlessly and it has been designed to minimize noise levels both inside and outside the building. Windows have been strategically placed to face away from housing. Our campus does not have any athletic programs or athletic fields and we do not allow students to drive to the campus so there's no reason for students to be outside the facility. The facility will be gated and closed after hours and on weekends when not in use. I want you to know that we recognize how important it is to be good stewards of this beautiful new facility. And while we will be busy developing leaders and building futures for Dallas ISD students, we will also serve as excellent members of the community. Now let's hear more about the design from WRA Architects. Thank you, Jean. Uh, my name is Seth Stevens. I'm with WRA Architects and um, We've been uh, happy to work with Dallas ISD, helping develop the Career Institute North. Um, um, unfortunately, the, the path of this project is uh, unusual in the, it actually was hit by the tornado back in uh, 2019. So most of you in the area definitely know that and remember that. Um, and that's sort of what spurred this project along. It's since been vacated. Um, there's a new campus down the street in the TJ site that's being built. Um, so this will no longer house the elementary school. Um, this is sort of the site plan condition as you can see it today. Uh, there's a construction fence that just kind of keeps people from uh, getting hurt inside the building currently. Um, kind of see there's a lot of damage to particularly the auditorium area. A lot of the windows have been uh, knocked out as well. So lots of debris, lots of damage inside the building. So part of the project is we're gonna renovate pretty much the entirety of the existing building. You can see the existing structure uh, is kind of highlighted in this yellow color here. Um, there were some other areas where there was a cooling, not a cooling tower, but an incinerator stack that had been vacated that uh, collapsed inside the building. So that part of the building is gonna be rebuilt uh, entirely. Um, and then the uh, old auditorium is gonna be kind of made into a, a career lecture hall type area, but uh, will be renovated. Um, I think as far as the keys go, the main entrance is the kind of number one here. The service yard is intended to stay where it currently is. Staff parking over in this uh, Northwest quadrant. Um, and then we do have a tornado shelter here um, on the number five area. And uh, most of the student drop off pickup is gonna occur where this number three is. Um, and like Jean mentioned, it's all gonna be done by bus. So no students will be driving to this campus. Uh, the only people really that will be here will be the occasional visitor, which isn't really gonna be that much stuff. And then the, uh, the staff that'll park kind of in this number four spot or maybe along uh, the city park to the south. Um, this slide basically just outlines the various uh, career pathways that um, Director Laswell was talking about. Um, the number one and two are the automotive and aviation labs, um, which also serves as the tornado shelter. So there's not really any windows in there. It'll keep all the sounds contained. The rest of the areas are sort of uh, career-based labs and, and standard classroom type areas. Um, the cafeteria is kind of gonna be in the central core and there is kind of a partially enclosed courtyard which you'll see a little bit later. Second floor plan, there's a couple of automotive classrooms in the tornado shelter, uh, aviation classrooms. And then on the second and third floor, we've got the health science classrooms. And the reason these are up here is because a lot of the other labs have higher function spaces and they don't stack well. So um, the medical office building type classrooms um, are the only ones on the third floor and they do face the, uh, the park to the south. 
Um, so they're not going to be really overlooking anyone's backyard. It's kind of a view along Midway. This is the student drop-off entrance on the south side, which does face the city, city park. Staff entrance area. The courtyard. Store just the security vestibule. Um, this is the lecture hall, which was the old auditorium. Student drop-off area. I guess just an item of note on the student drop-off area, this is a fairly good sized lobby area, so the students won't be um, hanging around outside, especially if there's sort of bad weather, but um, general project summary, the total building is 165,000 square feet, um, about 50,000 of that's additions. Um, Renovations, we're uh, repairing a lot of the existing buildings, structural repairs, replacing all the MEP, new floor, new roofs, um, new windows, basically replacing everything that was damaged from the, the tornado. Um, as far as the design and uh, progress of where this project is right now, um, we're pretty much at the end of the design phase, trying to get these out and get the, the drawings into the city so they can start the permit process. Demolition and construction is starting soon. Um, and then the estimated completion of the project where we should be done is spring of 2023. And just a real quick recap, uh, it's a career focused campus, 800 students max. Uh, currently they have about 400 um, at any given time. Um, so there won't be 800 immediately when this opens, but you know, it may grow to that at a maximum at some point. And that's, uh, basically split up morning and afternoon. So there'll be students there in the morning, they'll eat lunch and then they'll go to the back to their other campus and then they'll kind of split flop with the other students. Um, students will not be driving to this campus and the tornado shelter is designed to accommodate entire population of the students and staff. Um, here is a traffic management plan, just a general recap is we've got 18 buses shown here that's sort of just the maximum amount that you could potentially queue on the site at any time. Uh, we're really, at this point, it's probably eight buses. So the point is more that there won't be queuing on the Midway or Killian or Billfair really at any, any point in time um, when the project is in operation or the students are occupying it. Carl, do you have anything, or Hunter, do you have anything you wanna to add to this? No, I think that just points out that that's the worst case scenario. And, and obviously, if you had a maximum of eight on any given time, you still have plenty of room to queue the buses. The teachers obviously get there before the buses do, and they leave after the buses do. So that's not really an issue in that case. And as, as Jean mentioned, students are not allowed to drive or walk to the campus. So it'll either be teachers, administrators, or visitors in cars, um, and then uh, buses with students. Okay, um, that's pretty much most of the presentation. Um, I guess we'll open it up to questions. Yeah, this is Dave Rogers. First question, just on the traffic management plan. Um, if you're only expecting eight buses at a time, would you expect most of the traffic to come directly off Midway and not come down through Killian to the front of the school? Well, coming through Killian allows that, that access to that signal there. Um, so that's the, the purpose for that. Now, if buses were coming from the north, um, which I don't think any of them would be coming from the north, maybe WT White would swing across. Um, they, they could come off of Midway if they're going south of Midway, yes. But otherwise, they need to really get into that signal there at Killian. Uh, the, most of them would come from the south, and they really could make a U-turn uh, there at that at light. And um, we have a few questions um, that have been submitted through chat. Um, what is, how many buses are needed to transport 800 students? Well, you, you could probably, it, it averages about um, uh, 
50 kids or more so for, per bus, depending on the bus. Um, so that would be at a maximum of 16 buses. Um, but again, the, the likelihood of, first of all, there, there's not 800 students in the, on the, in the program right now. It would expand to that. So uh, 16 buses would likely be the maximum, maybe a few less. Um, but again, as Gene mentioned, they're becoming a different shifts over a 20 minute period. So there'd never be 16 buses on a, a campus at any given time. And that even includes for pickup because they'll be coming from other locations um, to pick up and the drop off at, at schools or TJ is five minutes away and North Dallas is, is the maximum time away. Um, you mentioned um, at the beginning of the presentation that the campus would be gated and closed during the day and after hours. Do you have elevations that show what the gates will look like and where they will be? Um, I've got a general, I can kind of point it out. Give me one second, let me share this again. So just kind of pointing it out real quick. Uh, in general, the gates are kind of here where my cursor is, and then kind of in the back here, the one by the teacher parking lot. And that's pretty much it. There's also a gate across the uh, the service yard. Okay, so it's not like a wall around the perimeter with like gates at every entrance. No, it's no, simple no. gate. It's more of an ornamental fence too, kind of like your wrought iron um, picket type stuff. Not not a chain link fence either. Um, would the was there ever any consideration to play? It's center on the carry side. It seems like a better fit since it would be co-located with TJ, thereby reducing the number of bus trips to the career center. I think the carry side is a larger area, so better suited for the larger career center. And um, it, kind of a related question, would the DISD consider removing the maintenance operations buildings located across Killian and then using that area as a to increase the area available to the Walnut Hill School site to keep the bus traffic up fair field, fair drive. Would, okay, I'm um, not sure who, who would want to answer this question, um, but um, Probably more than likely that one of the reasons that um, carry wasn't considered is because we do not require any type of parking or athletic fields. And so we fit on the smaller space much better than a K through eight program would. Um, and maybe someone can answer the other question about um, the second part of the question, because I'm not sure exactly that answer. Um, Right, to removing the maintenance operations buildings on Killian and then using that area as a parking lot to increase the area available for bus traffic. I really don't think it will be needed based on our um, current traffic flow pattern and plans. So, um, but I don't know what, you know, construction might offer for that question. Yeah, we don't currently have any any plans to remove that uh, maintenance location right now. Um, I think you can prevent students from parking on site, but how do you prevent them from parking in the neighborhood? Um, we have um, both a police officer on site and a security guard, and part of their uh, responsibilities will be monitoring um, that parking situation. Um, so we will um, be addressing that if that should occur. If we, we also have cameras on our site, so we know if we have students that are coming from the street level rather than from the bus. There's only one entrance, which is the bus entrance on that one side where the buses unload and load. And so they're not really allowed to enter into any other entrances um, of the campus. So I think um, a student might make that mistake once or twice, but um, definitely not after the first week or so when we get students um, used to the transition and taking the bus from their campus. 
um, we have a couple questions about the lighting and and how lighting would look will look and if that will impact, especially at night, um, the surrounding um, homes. I could probably answer that. So the fixtures and stuff that we have specified or intended to be full cut off. Um, so there really shouldn't be any light bleed off um, beyond the property line. Um, they'll also be on a kind of a smart system. So they'll kind of automatically turn on and off. Um, as they're programmed. I think that answers your question. And um, just to clarify, if it was something that was covered earlier, uh, how many days will the Career Institute be open and is it a year round program? It follows a traditional school calendar. Um, so, you know, we open when school starts in August, we close when school ends at the end, typically at the end of May. Um, and it's uh, five days a week that students come to our campus. Um, and we have very few weekend events. Um, there might be a tour or um, you know, some competition at the campus a couple of times a year, but we don't anticipate because we don't have a athletics, so we don't really have a lot of weekend events. Okay. And um, what is the percentage of green space that has been built onto the space in the new school design? That may be an architect or an architect question. Seth or Donovan, do you know that offhand? I don't know the exact percentage offhand, but we can we can work on it. Okay. And um, what feedback has the school or the city received from homeowners who are located directly across from the new school? Surely they didn't anticipate an industrial education building when they purchased their home since this type of facility appears well outside the space and height requirements of the neighborhood zoning. Well, it, it, it complies with the, the height requirements in the sense that the city of Dallas in their zoning ordinance has something called a residential proximity slope, which is a slope measured off of, in this case, single family property which we're kind of surrounded by on, I guess, two sides. One side is midway uh, and then the park to the south. Um, the height of the buildings will comply with that. Um, so we will comply with the residential proximity slope. Um, the makeup of the school is, is it different than an elementary school, obviously, um, but there's also less, um, I, would, I would say less traffic than an elementary school um, in a sense that I have 16 buses, we'll say, um, at a worst case scenario. And uh, Gene, what do you have? 50 staff members, maybe? That's um, correct. So how many? Sorry, that's so, correct. So we have 50 staff members and 16 buses, a few visitors, as opposed to an elementary school uh, that had, let's say, 400 kids or, or more, um, and parent pick up and drop off in the morning, uh, which would likely have, I would guess, uh, well over 100 cars probably in that scenario. Um, so I think uh, traffic wise, um, I think you're in a little better situation. Uh, if the bus arrives, buses arrive at nine o'clock versus the traffic in the surrounding streets at, at seven to eight o'clock or seven to eight thirty, you've got a little better scenario there than an elementary school. Obviously, it's not a neighborhood school in that sense. I agree. So may I jump in because this is Marla Hartzell. I have apparently a mic that I can speak for our neighbors, but yet to my dismay, I guess I'm very disappointed in the format of this because we were told that they would all have voices. So neighbors who are listening to this, I highly apologize. Um, the format of this is not what we expected. Um, you just mentioned residential neighborhood height. What is that exactly? Because from my understanding, homes can actually be built extremely taller than what they currently are. So when you say that, you might assume that the height of this school would be in line with the, with the homes around it. But in actuality, I think the homes that are built next to where this school will be are actually about a third of the height that could potentially be allowed. And the question that was asked earlier about green space, 
the green space answer is there is no green space. So my thought of what this meeting was to be about was specifically regard to, zone, to zoning, which would really fall to Ms. Murphy. Um, a lot of us on this call, I believe, were on this call a few weeks ago when we heard this entire presentation. We asked a lot of questions by chat. Our board did not feel that it was fair that there was a one-way conversation being had and that the neighbors that live directly next to the school could not be voiced their personal opinion. I live in the neighborhood. I do not live directly next to the school, but I do drive by it on a regular basis. So I wish right now we could change this and allow those neighbors who live on Field Fair and who live on Killian to, for you to hear their plea and hear their questions versus it being asked through a chat, which I think is actually a very much of a disadvantage to most people. I think you all need to hear their voices. So is there some way we can change this and allow for their voices to be heard when asking questions, their faces to be seen? Anyone can respond, but I don't think this is a fair format again. So um, we, anybody can, um can um, join in and ask a question. We were asking to do it through the chat to make sure that we were answering all the questions that everyone had, but um, nobody has any kind of special privilege. So if anybody would like to um, share their opinion and comments um, in, in a civil manner, that would be, the, it, it, they will just unmute themselves. Great. I want our neighbors to know they can do that. I don't think this has been set up to be for them to understand that they can versus questions being asked for them. And my question would be, why would we be okay as a neighborhood and why would DISD be okay as a that we think that our neighborhood would want a building as large as you are proposing on a very small piece of land why would we be okay with that? This is not about the school, the type of school. This is about the actual proximity of the building and it towering over everything else around it. Um, and I'd like Margo maybe to jump in and, and advise our neighborhood what she thinks about it and or what rights do we have to argue against a building of this size being plopped into our neighborhood? And I'll mute myself. Marla, hi, this is Margo Murphy and thank you for your question. I just want you to know that when this meeting was set up, it was set up with the intent that uh, those participating would be able to ask questions directly and not just through the chat. So I think that has now been confirmed and your uh, fears have been assuaged. Um, uh, of course, I'm here to listen to all the concerns that you have, and I'm, I'm listening quite carefully about uh, the height concern and the lot coverage concern. Um, I, I, I'm not in a position to, uh, to give you an opinion right now because I'm supposed to uh, remain neutral until the, uh, the public hearing. So I'm here to listen and I'm here to help uh, shepherd uh, the case through the process and answer any questions you may have. So um, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Crawley addressed the question about the residential proximity slope. I think it would be most helpful to, um, to everyone if there could be a graphic prepared that showed how the uh, school proposed school campus complies with the residential proximity slope. Um, I believe one of you on, on I, that I, whose face I could see on the, on the screen um, uh, was holding up the number three because I think Mr. Crawley mentioned that the RPS only applied, applied from two areas. Um, and I think it applies. And so we'll make sure that um, all the, the RPS as it applies is, is uh, um, my, my, my request is for there to be a sketch that would be shared with, with the neighbors. But the second question that you asked Ms. Hartzell has to do with uh, lot coverage and green space. So I think the way the city of Dallas zoning code refers to it is lot coverage and whether they use um, the remainder as, as green space or not is, is something else. But um, you ask a very good question and we've asked Mr. Crawley to uh, calculate that information before. So um, 
I, I imagine they should have that readily available to us as well. Um, so I hope that addresses your questions um, that you've asked so far, and I, I'll mute myself and stand by to listen to other questions. Thank you. Hey, Margo, real quick, um, it looks like we've got a lot coverage of about 43% is what I show, so. And um, we do have a lot of questions about um, the, the flow of the buses when they come in and how they will exit and onto what streets. I don't know if, if maybe you can go, someone can go that again and um, maybe with the picture so that um, everyone can get a better idea. Seth, will, that, will you be doing that? Yeah, and, and this is Margo Murphy again. I think there may be some confusion. I think what the, the, the neighbors want to know is, will the buses be entering um, on Midway onto Killian, or are they going to be coming through the neighborhood, like on Field Fair, then onto Killian? I think that's the question. So they want to know, will they be coming from Midway first and then accessing the light at Killian to enter the property? That, that is the plan. They will come into the site off of that driveway on Killian off of Midway through the light. Um, now, the bus from TJ will likely just come down Killian, obviously, because it's just on Killian. Um, instead of going back on, the mid, back on the Walnut Hill, back into Midway, and then back into Killian. So the bus on, uh, I, would, I would, logic would say, would from, from TJ would come down Killian from TJ then enter the site, and then depending on where it's going next, it would go back to um, Field Fair, then over to Killian, and then um, back to the light. So Seth, if you want to show them the sort of logical way they would come in here with your cursor. Yeah, they would enter there. It's one way through the site, and then it would, they would um, uh, drop off at number three down below, the student entrance exit the field fair, go back to the light to Killian to go north, south, I guess, or east. Why wouldn't they turn left? Turn left onto Killian? No, onto field fair. Uh, well, they, they could if they were going to turn right onto Walnut Hill, but there's no schools except TJ that are that direction. They wouldn't turn left on a walnut. They wouldn't turn left on the on Walnut Hill from there at Field Fair. They'd, they'd use the light to turn. And that is for for per safety purposes, correct? That traffic. Right. Flow? Yeah. You, the buses don't like making left turns going across traffic unless they have a light to protect them, if at all possible. And if there's a light there, they'll use a light. Well, there's a lot more traffic if you were to turn right on Phil Fear and Killian than there is if you were to turn left and head out to Walnut Hill. And just if you want to go sit at that corner, I think the neighbors who live there would agree. But I'm just throwing out a neighborly bit of facts. Again, this is at nine o'clock in the morning or uh, off hours, probably. You know, there I'm sure there was a lot of traffic when the school was there. I don't know how much traffic is there now at nine in the morning or nine thirty in the morning. Um, yeah, and again, I think it's, if, if I think it's bus more that buses right. are just a lot louder too than cars. So if if you can maybe flip to the map of like where all the feeder schools are, I feel like there could be an option that buses could be routed to like Royal and come from the north and turn directly into the drop off rather than doing the, you know, just kind of stay out of the neighborhood with, you know, an extra minute to get to Royal instead of Walnut Hill. See, so you've got Hillcrest, all those are north, right? They can come down Royal and go in. So you've really got really just North Dallas High School is the only one that might have to come from the south. That could help us in the neighborhood. Uh, is this part of Margo Murphy's scope also, this traffic study and where the buses would go?
So at City Plan Commission, we review uh, the traffic management plan and we rely heavily on the uh, opinion of the engineer at this in city staff at the city of Dallas. Um, generally, the traffic management plan um, has to do with management of traffic um, really just from the adjacent street onto the campus. So what I think you are referring to is a traffic impact analysis, and that is broader in scope than a traffic management plan. And a traffic impact analysis uh, includes how traffic moves in and out in a broader area. I don't believe a TIA, as it's called, would be required in this case because that is only... Um, um, it does not meet the minimum for a TIA. That there's a minimum amount of traffic that has to be coming to a site for the city to require that study. Um, if there's any city staff online, you can jump in and help me or, or, or Mr. Lumley, the traffic engineer, you, you, you would know more about that. But um, uh, can you uh, comment, please, sir? Yeah, so you, you're exactly right. The city didn't ask for that much of a scope. Um, the only real scope that we were asked to do was to complete this traffic management plan that essentially um, gears toward the routes of the buses so that we can we can orient them in a path that would, as is being suggested of where we can route those buses to go. Um, yes, the the traffic management plan is suggesting that the buses would exit the site onto Field Fair, turn right, get back onto Killian, and then use the convenience of this traffic signal at Midway. Um, I, I, I think the plan is with this traffic management plan that all buses would go uh, come from and go to Walnut Hill as opposed to Royal, except for the uh, exception of Thomas Jefferson, which they would obviously use Killian. And, I wonder and, since there's no traffic signal there now because it got blown away with the tornado, there would be an option to put a traffic signal, you know, more in line with the new driveway for the drop off. So I believe there's a new traffic signal that has already been designed and ordered for the intersection of Killian and Midway Road. Um, it, but uh, we can ask the city traffic engineer to to comment on that, and I will I will uh, get an answer to that question uh, tomorrow. But I believe that's the answer, Mr. L and I have a couple of more comments, but Mr. Lumley, do you I have? I would add that? Did the Killian um, inter that intersection was damaged by the tornado and that's the one that we had to that's getting reimbursed through TxDOT. So that is in the process of getting replaced. I'll be brand new. Thanks, Council Member Gates. Also, um, I know that uh, there is some concern and I can hear, hear it clearly that um, you'd like to minimize the impact of buses because they're louder than, um, you know, ordinary motor vehicles on neighborhood streets. Um, and so I understand that. Um, I believe that the city of Dallas um, uh, labels or identifies streets and some are city neighborhood streets and some are collectors and some are thoroughfares. Um, again, Mr. Lumley, you'll have to jump in and help me. My guess is that Field, field Fair would likely be a collector um, and would be designed to handle the kind of traffic that the school is uh, is attempting to put on there. I think somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 18 buses um, is something the city would look at and you know, four times a day um, spread out throughout the day. I, I think the city will look at that, but I can get an answer to that question for you. Mr. Lumley, do you know how, uh, how that street is identified? I would say that a collector is a good representation of it which would be a capacity to handle that 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 type of traffic and that amount of traffic so yes i would say you're correct thank you have you been paying attention to esd's traffic management for its new carpools all of that traffic pours out onto midway And it's, it's pretty it, crazy I'm, I'm, right now. I, I'm very well aware of, of the traffic. This is, again, Margot Murphy. I'm uh, very well aware of the traffic situation on Midway Road. 
um, that is a result of ESD. Um, by way of background, um, they had the zoning in place before um, either Council Member Gates or I were in our current positions. And so um, they had the zoning in place to add the lower school to the existing middle and high school. Um, however, the city of Dallas has been working with them to improve their traffic management plan. I will also, by way of information, let you know that there is a current pending uh, zoning matter there at ESD and a revised traffic management plan is part of that zoning um, of that zoning request. So I'm very well aware and, um, the, and have spent quite a bit of time just watching traffic at, at peak hours for schools, both morning and afternoon. Um, I do think that there has been, the city has also sent out its uh, traffic engineers to view traffic um, and, and may have some traffic counts. I believe that, that it, believe it or not, the traffic has improved um, on Midway Road uh, because Walnut Hill has not been in operation. And so that has been an improvement, but we're definitely looking at it. And I encourage you to, uh, you know, weigh in and participate on that ESD zoning case and uh, let us know what you think about the traffic there too. Yeah, it's, it's ESD, the new career center and St. Monica too. That that traffic is all happening around the same time. Right, within right. That, there, the one mile area. Yes, we're very well aware of the number of schools and it's not just those schools, there are more uh, in, in that one mile square area. And, and we've, we've looked at that over the years and, and done what we can to uh, improve the traffic situation. The two new signals, um, the one at Killian and Midway, along with the one that has already been paid for and is planned for Merrill and Midway will be smart signals. And they will they they will improve the the functioning and the, the way traffic uh, uh, operates on Midway Road. Um, what I, I know enough to be dangerous, and they use the word gaps. It will create some gaps uh, in in traffic, and uh, and apparently it will move a little bit more efficiently and effectively. So would this body consider relocating the light at Killian further south? to the new career center entrance to try to keep the majority of buses on Midway? So I think that's a highly technical question that I can throw over to the city engineer, but um, there are certain um, prerequisites for that. Um, and it is very difficult to get a, a, a signal um, where it um, just serves the school alone. So, cause I think you're suggesting it would it would it would be moved further south and it would just serve the school because the signal is meant to serve just more than the school. It's meant to serve the neighborhood. No, so no, the not really. That the streets are basically the exact same, whether it's the Killian and then the, the across the street, or if you put it south and it was South Crest and the new street you're building, it would be essentially the same thing. The signal was there for crosswalks for children when Walnut Hill Elementary was in existence. That's it part of the reason it was there. Probably not the sole reason, but that's part of the reason. I mean, I can, I can ask the traffic, traffic engineer that question. If I could comment on that, um, I would also say not only is there a traffic volume element to a signal, but there's also a distance element to it. And the closer that you would get to the existing signal at Midway and Walnut Hill, uh, presents more problems. So the further you can get it away from that existing signal, uh, the better the usage of the signal at Killian in terms of gaps, and, um, as Commissioner Murphy was suggesting. So um, one is if you had a an additional signal at the driveway, it would create issues. I guess there's a, 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 a option where we would remove the signal at Killian and add a signal at this driveway, but also those volume warrants that come up would, the Killian intersection meets warrants. So you would have to have a real reason to remove the signal, which I don't believe there would be one. Uh, so that would create issues as well.
there was a mention of a hearing coming up. Is that a public hearing? And do we have option to have representation at that hearing? And when is it? The, the public hearing at the plan commission is tentatively, and I say tentatively, we don't get to set the date, the staff does, set for uh, April 8th. Uh, and it is a hearing that's conducted somewhat like this, in a sense that it's not a public hearing where you can appear in, in person. Um, I'm assuming the rules are not going to change between now and April 8th. Um, so, and and again, if, if you got a postcard for this meeting, you will get uh, two letters from the city of Dallas, one for the city planning commission hearing and one for the city council hearing. Um, also, um, the um, uh, public notice is printed in the Monday newspapers um, or online, I guess, on the Dallas Morning News webpage. So um, if you didn't get that notice, that would be one way to check on it. Um, but again, um, it's tentatively scheduled for April 8th. That would then put it at the city council sometime uh, probably the uh, a month to six weeks later at the city council. So, um, I, so if, I, I may, if I may jump in, thank you, Mr. Crawley and Mr. Rogers. Thank you for, I think that's who asked the question. So uh, um, Mr. Crawley is right. Uh, for the last year, we have been uh, like city council hosting all meetings via Zoom. However, you are uh, entitled to and encouraged to participate um, individually. And if you want to um, get representation, of course, some people do as well. Uh, but it is um, it is customary for us uh, at the public hearing to get public input. Um, public members of the public are required to register a, a day or two before the scheduled hearing, and then we get a speakers list, um, and then you will be called from the host of the meeting and you will be online and, and, and you'll be given a few minutes to speak and then we ask you to stay online so we can we can ask questions. In addition, and I, I must say the meetings have been working well. I don't, um, I, I think they've worked very well and people feel like they've been given the opportunity to speak and to be heard. Um, additionally, um, uh, any emails, uh, you guys can email me or you can call me. Um, if you email me I, and you wanna talk, I'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, any emails that you do send to me, it's my custom to uh, share them with everyone on the commission. I send them all to the city secretary, uh, the commission secretary, and she sends them to uh, other commissioners. So in advance of the hearing, um, the other commissioners um, have an idea of what uh, some members of the public's opinion are on a, on a particular zoning project. Uh, but yes, you're very much encouraged to participate. Uh, the sign up is Tuesday at 5 p.m. before the Thursday hearing. So you have to sign up before 5 p.m. on Tuesday before the Thursday hearing. And I will um, echo uh, Mr. Crawley's statement that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an appointee, I'm a volunteer, and I have nothing to do with scheduling. Um, likewise, uh, the zoning consultants don't, that, that, that's in solely in the hands of city staff. So when we get the agenda, we that's when we learn as well. Sometimes we have a hint because Mr. Crawley's working with city staff and, and they will say so, but I don't often know until it's scheduled. This is and, F and FYI, the docket will come out the Friday before the hearing. So this, um, we don't have a hearing Thursday or next Thursday. I think our next hearing is the 24th. So we will get the docket. It will be on the city website the Friday before then. And um, all of the information we have is, is it, you can download it as well. It's all public information. Kathy had a question. I don't know if you wanna unmute yourself if you can and, and um, jump in. This is Kathy Adcock Smith. I am a neighbor in the Walnut Hill um, district here. And one question has come up many times among the neighbors is why has there not been an alternative use explored for this building? Something that is smaller scale, that fits the, the scale of the neighborhood. We understand that a lot of the pre-K programs were smushed together into, um, because of having the schools having to pick up a sixth grade. And we're wondering if that building wouldn't have been better suited as a pre-K center to relieve those other schools that may not be able to offer those programs 
because of having to take on a sixth grade. And if I'm wrong about that information, I'd like to be corrected, but it just seems like it, the scale of the school would work much easier and much better would fit the neighborhood for a pre-K center instead of uh, this big industrial hunk of a building that's been designed. So this is Evelyn Flores. Uh, I'm the trustee for this area and I was a trustee 15 years ago when we switched uh, to most of our elementary schools having uh, not having the sixth grade anymore. So that's kind of hashtag old news, first of all. Uh, and in terms of having pre-K available, pre-K available uh, is available to 15,000 students right now. In the Dallas Independent School District, we serve upwards of 94 or 95% of uh, the available seats uh, that, that are required out there. We built pre-K centers or additions at Walnut Hill and Anne Frank and elsewhere, uh, and we, we, but they're attached to an elementary school. We do not have separate pre-K centers anywhere in the Dallas Independent School District because they just don't make sense. It's better to have them in the same neighborhood school as, as the families. So, so Catherine, I'm sorry, but, but I think that, that you may have been provided erroneous information. I'll jump in, Edwin. Um, so, um, so that's not true that whenever we did the TJ realignment and Madrano became the only junior high now serving the TJ feeder system that the elementaries didn't have to take on sixth grade. Are you talking about after the tornado? Correct. All are all of the right because we had a tornado and now we're building a new K-8 school as you asked for, and we had a community meeting about that about a year ago. In fact, two months before the tornado, the, the Walnut Hill parents asked if we could have a K-8. Unfortunately, we had a tornado, uh, but we did listen, and we are building a new K-8 school that's going to accommodate uh, the Walnut Hill families and that community uh, and, the, and the community at, at large, and it's, we're very excited about that new uh, transformation school that's a uh, triple language, so it's dual language plus Chinese, and we also have the leadership program there, and all the teachers are talented and gifted certified, so we're very excited about that program as well. Uh, it's going to serve about 800 kids on the new K-12 TJ campus, uh, so yeah, and that actually is a new format, uh, but it, it was the, the change in configuration at the middle schools was because of the tornado, and it doesn't happen anywhere else in the Dallas Independent School District. But aren't y'all telling us that the whole reason why we're getting the Career Institute is also because of the tornado? So wouldn't it go hand in hand that if you are now, let's, you could tell me, because I don't know, but if there are five elementary schools that had to take on a sixth grade, I sat in a meeting at Madrano and Angie, um, I forget her last name, but she is the one that announced to the audience that how would y'all be taking on those sixth graders? The answer mm -hmm. was they would have to reduce the pre-K program. That wasn't, is that not what has occurred? Do those schools no, not that's, have that's, sixth grade? That's, that's not what has occurred at all. Where are the sixth graders? They're still so in the if, Excuse me, if I may chime in, I mean, we're sure. approaching the end of the hour and um, I just want to keep the questions uh, to uh, focus on the zoning issue. So could we go back to some zoning questions? We do have a couple of questions that um, not exactly zoning, but more about how the, the students will be handled. Um, I think maybe Jean can address this one. Um, how will you monitor attendance to, to make sure that students stay on the campus or on the campus and maybe not walking around? Um, in the neighborhood or in the park. That's something that you touched on at the beginning, but if maybe you can go through the process of how you will be monitoring that, that might be helpful. Yes, yeah, so we only have one entrance where students unload from the uh, buses into the center. Um, the same entrance is also where they exit. Um, we have cameras that monitor all of our um, exit doors. We also have alarms that sound or um, motion sensors that sound if our uh, people are exiting out those doors when, when we are trying to 
um, have class or anything of that nature. So we do have it monitored. Um, we are already operating Career Institute North here at our temporary facility, and we have not had one single incident of a student leaving our campus. Um, so I really, at this point, do not feel that's gonna be an issue. And I know that we have systems in place, both with the way our administration um, is scheduled to monitor in egress and out, outgoing students as well as uh, incoming. And then also um, our camera systems, our security uh, guard, our police officer, of our hall monitors, we have it in place. We're, we're working that plan right now. It's very successful. Um, it will be successful on this new campus as well. We even have a better structure there than we do here to make sure it, it, it happens. So I really uh, can assure you that that will not be the case um, and we will be monitoring our students closely. Um, Jean, another question that came through the chat. Um, it's uh, about how many students are going to be at the campus at one time? Because we're talking about 800 students total, but will you have 800 students there like at any given time or how are you going to switch them? Because there's two, there's two schedules, right? Yes, there's actually uh, four groups of students that come. Um, we have a group that comes in the morning, a group that comes in the afternoon on A days, a different group that comes on B days in the morning, and a different group that comes on B days in the afternoons. So at any given time at capacity, we're looking at 800 students in any one of those groups. Okay, so, um, so the 800 actually, you know, it's 3,200 different students, but only 800 on the campus at any one time. So the rest of the time they're on their home campus taking their core classes, going to their extra, extracurricular activities, um, and they're not on our campus. And how many students will there be per, per bus? Uh, people who are doing the math in the background wanted to see what the capacity for the bus is. Yeah, at capacity, our buses hold 50 students, approximately 50 students. So, um, you know, at capacity, I would expect 16. But again, not all at one time because um, we do have the 20 minute staggered approach and then we have a, a staggered exit as well. I was gonna ask if you could share the slides from this meeting and also if we could get north and west elevations. My backyard looks directly at Walnut Hill Elementary. So I was interested to see what it would look like from the north side and the west side. That's what I'd be looking at. Sure, absolutely. I can get those to Bob and he can distribute them. And we can yeah. also post it. We will be posting uh, the recording of the on the website, uh, the Bond 2015 website, and we will legally add the, um, the presentation slides if, um, when they're available. Hi, this is Florence Dur I've been posting a lot of comments and questions in the chat rather than speaking them and so unfortunately I haven't been able to see what anyone else's comments or questions are and you know I, I put these comments in as they come up and as people are talking about things well we have access everyone publicly to what's being shared in the chat I mean this being a public meeting Yes, those are, we, we make copies of those and put them on our website. Which website and can you share the link in the chat out to everyone? It's the Dallas ISD uh, 2015, or is it the, the 2020 bond uh, website. I, I, I can get staff uh, to get me that information and I can get it to Bob. It's listed on the bond 2015 website currently. So they'll post all the chat questions from the whole neighborhood there? And the video from this meeting. Okay. The last meeting, the chat wasn't posted. So, so I'm not sure if that was just by accident, but if y'all could get that posted also, that'd be great. So what we normally don't post um, the, the chats, but we do uh, develop an FAQ and uh, the questions that are asked are reflected there. 
so that, you know, questions that are similar, we don't have them like five or six different times. So, but we'll, we'll develop an FAQ that will go on that website as well, based on the questions that you've asked tonight. Well, un unfortunately, sometimes things get lost in interpretation and consolidation. Could our homeowners association at least get a copy of the chat just so we know what the homeowners are asking and what their concerns are and um, how in general our neighborhood feels about things because this has been very one sided. Yeah, I can see about getting that to Bob. Well, to, the, to that point, I mean, is there anyone else that has comments that we haven't heard? I'm, I'm still willing to sit and listen. I had a question about the AB schedule. Uh, if there's a five-day school work week, um, how does an AB schedule work with that? And so typically, um, the, the A day will be on Monday and Wednesday, and the B day will be Tuesday and Thursday, and then Friday, it rotates. So the first Friday will be an A day, the second Friday will be a B day. So okay. every, the students are basically coming to us every other day on a five day schedule. I guess, Margo, here's what I was interested in seeing tonight. I was interested in learning what are the actual zoning requirements in place right now? And what is required for the PD for this new building to be built? And what concessions the neighborhood would make um, in granting the PD? I was wanting to understand. So I think that question is best addressed by their zoning consultant, Mr. Crawley. That's who typically would answer this question. And then I can I can add color if necessary, but Mr. Crawley. In addition, we have our city attorneys um, are on board as, as well too, if there's a if there's a legal question. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, the existing zoning is single family, R16, which allows single family homes, allows churches, allows, that's about it pretty much, 16,000 square foot lot. Um, the existing school obviously was built I don't know, Seth, close to uh, not 100 years, but a long time ago, um, before zoning was required for public schools. Uh, public schools in Dallas were required to get zoning starting in 1989. Um, and since there was no reason to zone this property for the school, it was allowed to remain there, obviously. Um, um, once the any additions were made to the school, or in this case, the school obviously was um, destroyed, or virtually destroyed by the tornado, um, we would be required to get zoning on the property. The zoning for this site um, will be a plan development district, which will be written for this site. It will be that site plan that Seth has shown you. Basically, that's a stylized version of it, but it'll lay out the buildings, the heights, the setbacks, the parking locations. Um, all those things will be written just for this one campus. There's no other campus like it in Dallas and there's no other zoning like it in Dallas. ESD is the same way. The TJ uh, Pre-K-8 campus is the same way too. Those are planned development districts. So the rules will be written for it. And part of uh, schools in Dallas that require a traffic management plan, you saw the drawing part of the traffic management plan in the, in the presentation. There's also text that goes with it, talks about um, how the school zones come into play, where they're at, um, the pickup and drop off times, things of that nature. It's um, signed by the principal. Jean will sign that, that she agrees that she'll um, implement that. And also the DISD police sign off on it, that they reviewed it and they will uh, work towards implementing it. So that's the zoning that's being proposed for the property. Um, it will be that, there'll be a landscape plan. I don't think we had it in our docket material or in our presentation material, but it'll be a landscape plan that will be written for this site. Um, it'll emphasize trees along the perimeter and everything, but those will both be part of the zoning and we'll have to comply with that. So um, it is it is tailored for this site and this side of it. Uh, Mr. Crawley, then the simple question is then really what you're doing is saying that, well, where we used to have a K-12 or excuse me, a, a K-6 elementary school 
we're going to move that and we're going to make a three-story building for teenagers. Is that correct? Uh, I believe there was a K-5 school there and then this will be a career center. That is correct. But understood. In a three-story versus what was just a single story that probably housed 400 kids and now we're going to go to, uh, what was that number, 3,200? Is that correct? No, 800 yeah. kids at any given time. At any given time. Okay, fair enough. And did the uh, elementary school that was there before, did they have busing as well? Uh, I don't have the answer. Yes. They did? So, they, so, the, so the neighborhood should be used to buses coming and going? Very little buses. Okay. Yeah, it was a transfer school. Actually, it was 80% transfer students. There were very few that live in our neighborhood. Right. They came from all over. So actually, it was a lot of cars. To be so most of the cars. Okay. Right. So now, we go to that school, and it was it was all cars. It wasn't buses. Got it. So so now the neighbors that were used to cars are going to have to get used to buses, and they were used to one story. Uh, facility and now they're going to get used to a three-story facility is that correct well but but to be honest they were used to maybe a hundred or more cars at any given time versus 16 buses right that's semantics okay no that's that's actually traffic volume no but it was also so, morning and afternoon versus now it's three times a day and then do we also expect reparations to the Houses that are along Killian, whose property values will undoubtedly go down because of this? I would say Killian, Field Fair, and South Better homes that are looking over the school. Okay, so those houses then, are you looking for reparations for them? Because their property values will go down. That's a given. I mean, if I'm held selling a house, and I have a elementary school close by with a playground versus a, a school that is a vocational school. I think that when I'm selling a home, it has a little bit more panache, if you will, with a elementary school versus vocational. Am I correct? Right. If I, 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 can I step in? Because we, regarding this, Jennifer Gates, and regarding this is a question that you're raising on what's allowed by zoning. And there is some state law um, regarding schools and, you know, schools are supposed to be in neighborhoods. I have asked this question. This is not the, this is a different type of school than that's originally, originally placed there, the elementary school. So what, what kind of basis do we have to support or reject a zoning case um, right to school. So I think Casey Burgess, our city attorney is on board. And I just want you all um, to be aware of, you know, what's, what the school districts can legally do um, regarding school sites. So Casey, I saw you on Ms. there. Gates. Yes. Yeah. Hey, good evening. Yeah. This is Casey Burgess. Uh, so sorry, the, the zoom meeting kind of broke up, but I think I got the question. So it was why us, uh, why schools can legally do zoning? Right. The, the is question that, is, what is the legal, what is the, the right of this, of this, you know, how, did the school have a right to go there in this type of residential zoning? Yes. So, yeah, there's been uh, a number of, of cases through the years in Texas courts, a number of attorney general opinions that have been issued. Uh, and they've all, they've all said that um, a public school can locate in a residentially zoned area that a city um, can't prohibit them. Um, cities can require them to go through the SUP process, which the city currently does, to be a specific use permit. And, uh, you know, you can, cities can regulate, just kind of can't regulate them out of the area, but can regulate things, you know, like, say, parking, building height, setbacks, um, traffic management, things like that. Um, can do a little bit with the aesthetics, but yeah, we uh, cities cannot prohibit schools in residential areas. And, and how you explained to me that it, it was not, you know, not just, it's ancillary uses to schools as well. And there's examples of even, right. um, so it, would you explain that? Because these are yeah, so there's uh, there, there's actually been a couple of cases. Uh, one involved DISD and 
the city of Addison to where a uh, school district wanted to go in and put in a, a bus parking lot. And the court said, yeah, that's a school use. You have to allow that. Um, so that that's kind of the big one there. But yeah, it's been, uh, courts have said, yeah, it's not just a school as such, but it's anything really um, associated with the school. So courts have been pretty clear that, you know, cities regulate health and safety and schools, you know, ISDs, they, they're they charged with educating children. So, you know, cities can regulate the health and uh, safety aspects of schools, but we can't really get into, you know, where they put facilities or how they educate children. So, I mean, Ms. Murphy and I are, um, you know, we're looking at these height restrictions. I mean, those are height setbacks, um, the traffic management can all be um, called out for in the PD, which is the planning document that governs the zoning for this area. So that we, we really, um, we have to focus on those issues. I mean, the, they could put DISD as they, and, and I think it's important. I mean, we as a city have to partnership with our public school system. Um, and so in schools belong in neighborhoods. I know this is not the type of school that was originally there, but we're looking at it from the aspects of, um, you know, what, what parts of the project um, that we can, uh, you know, put guidelines on. And, and in the height is one, the RPS, the residential proximity slope is something we have told DISD from the beginning that we enforce. Um, so we're going to make sure that and as well as, you know, mitigating the traffic, the flow, um, and the other lot coverage setbacks. Um, we cannot, um, actually like building materials that's not allowed. Casey can refer to that, but that's now state law doesn't allow us to call out for, for building materials. So from a layman's perspective, then the school's coming. Okay. Now the, all we can do is just adjust the height of it and the traffic around it. Is, is that right? So right. I was I mean, the city, the city well, can't, de city can't right. deny the school use okay. there, but we I mean, can govern the, the land use. Look, I mean, yeah. For all my neighbors, why didn't you start with that? Why didn't you start with the fact that look, this building's coming, all we, all we, the school's coming, all we can do is adjust the height and the traffic around it. So, you know, uh, again, I look at all this and it's like, you know, for the poor people that live on Killian and the streets around it, they are going to have more buses. Their their property values are going to go down. I don't even have a dog in that hunt, and I'm telling you, somebody should be saying this. Okay, that's really all I have to say. Well, and the people that we vote on, and the people, and I, Jennifer, I don't actually mean you, because you're actually legal. But the people that we vote on, and the people that support this neighborhood in the future, and um, our trustee who is on this call, who we have been saying this for months, literally since January of 2020, um, we have been ignored. And so we are getting our voice out there. Jennifer, we've had this conversation. I understand the parameters of what we are able to affect. I want to go back to one thing that you didn't just mention that I'd love a picture to be shown again. Um, the architect, I think earlier said, did you say 42 or 47 percent land use? Could you show us how that large of a building only adds up to less than half of the lot? And if so, are you referring to that the parking lot is not a building and therefore that's where you're getting the other 50 some odd percent? Because I'm going to so I'm gonna jump in and I yeah. asked for a graphic on that. I think it's an awesome question. And I think you should, uh, we should get a visual about that and a visual about RPS. What I will say this is that the city code defines lot coverage. And so there is no wiggle room. And so what you and I in, in the might, you know, in the vernacular might think is lot coverage might not align what's within the city code. Um, and so, um, you know, um, I don't know, Mr. Burgess, if you want to jump in and, and talk about what lot coverage covers, but I think, I think they, the architect is going to have to give us uh, a graphic um, that aligns with the city code. Which what you currently have does not? Is that what you're saying? No, what I'm saying is that 
I, I don't know, uh, you know, I think you referred to green space. Yeah. I don't think it just has to be green space. It can be more than that that is, that, um, is not counted against lot coverage. Yeah, That's lot coverage it only counts buildings. If, if, there, if you cannot see the sky, i.e. or even, a, even an awning would be lot coverage um, under certain circumstances, but any building that I can't look up and see the sky is lot coverage. So if, if I'm sitting in a parking lot, it's not lot coverage. But a home can't pave their entire backyard legally. So why could a school? Uh, they, can, they can pave their whole backyard. They can't put a building in it, but they could pave their whole backyard. Sure. And you could pave your whole front yard too. Mm -hmm. You have to have a couple of trees in the front, I guess, and one in the back. But otherwise, you could pave your whole yard. Yes. Yeah, you that's and we have impervious coverage is the way it's dictated on how you pay your um the watershed i mean your um water bill storm wa the stormwater fee so the more lot coverage you have the higher your stormwater fee is um but you are you can pave um you just can't have buildings on those structures and um we have mm -hmm. gone uh well over our allotted time and this is these have been really great questions i did post the um the link to where the materials that we discussed, including the recording of this meeting, will be posted, and that was um, shared with everyone. Ms. Murphy, if you would you like to share the information, um, the meeting, the zoning meeting that will be taking place again? Well, so I don't, I don't know it. I mean, it hasn't been posted yet, so I won't know it. I think well, what what I can do make is sure if, if my office well, we can. Um, send that information out. Those that are in the notification zone will be getting a card and will be asking to reply to that card. Um, but we we can put it as soon as we are made aware from the city staff when the note when the two public hearings will be the CPC commission as well as the council meeting. We can send that out by email. But you will be if you're within the notification zone, you will be getting a card that will have that date on it. Um, right. And I would ask. Um, I know the the neighborhoods asked for the comments. If there's comments been, that's been shared, because I haven't been able to see them, if there's been comments shared directly to DISD in the chat, so if you would share that with myself and Ms. Murphy. Um, and then again, any, any other um, positions that the neighborhood wants to take, they can send both um, to my city account, which is jennifer.gates at dallascityhall.com, as well as Margo's, which your CPC, Dash G13 at DallasCityHall.com. I'll put it in the chat for you guys as well. Jennifer, if I may jump in. Um, uh, do we get when we get the staff report, I often um, I often print out the staff report for a particular project in D13. And through Council Member Gates's office, they go to um, the homeowners association, the president of the homeowners association for the affected area. And so Mr. Noyce has been um, kind enough several times uh, to share that with the neighbors in, in his neighborhood association. And so we will ask him again to do that. And so when I get it the Friday before, I'll send that, I'll send it off to, to Bob or to, to Jennifer, who'll send it to Bob. Um, and because we really do try, I mean, that's over and above. We really do try and keep everyone in the loop. Mr. Noyce, are you? You're, I think you're frozen, but you've done that for us. Margo, he's got it. I'll say okay. yes. I got it. Yeah, I, I'd be more glad to send it out and help everybody else. Thank you. There was just one last question that I they really would like an answer to. Where will the construction staging take place? Good question. And if the architects could um, maybe let us, or the contractor let us know that. And um, wait. can I jump in? Uh, uh, oftentimes in a zoning case like this, um, I ask um, for the uh, applicant to enter into a neighborhood agreement. We've done that with other schools that have gone up. And what, what that really does is it's a letter from the applicant in this case, either the construction firm or DISD or the bond office that lets you know when they intend to start construction and what their protocol is gonna be. Oftentimes you want um, the uh, construction workers 
uh, to park in certain places, or if there's an abundance of construction workers, you want them to kind of be uh, bussed in so that they'll have minimal impact on the neighborhood. Uh, the other thing that I typically ask that be placed in the neighborhood letter is an emergency number so that if something happens after hours or too early or too late, um, neighbors can call that versus 311 because we want them to get really immediate response to the extent that's possible. Um, so things of that nature. So we can, we, Mr. Crawley, could you make a, a note of that? Because that's a very good question. And if you have an idea about what construction would look like now, I'll let you finish answering that question. The, the contractor's on the call. The contractor's already been uh, chosen, so they can answer that question. He was here. Is he not here, <laughs> Seth? Yeah, it looks like they, they dropped off and we're, we're past our time. Um, I think I can sort of answer. In general, they're going to stage all the stuff inside the property. Um, the parking lot that's along Midway is going to kind of remain, and they're going to use that all as their uh, staging and also their construction parking. So they're not anticipating anything really being on the city um, city streets or the neighborhood streets. Um, and they'll they'll keep their concealed fences up while they're doing the construction, just so you don't have to look at piles of uh, construction stuff that's not completed. Uh, but we can we can work out a um, the the district has guidelines for all contractors to comply with how they're um, badged and everything else. Um, so we'll um, we can put that into I'm sure it's a form they have and a, and a list of things that we can make that available to the neighborhood um, where we can get with uh, Seth can get with a contractor and come up their lay down yard and where their parking is and we can. Uh, Put that and send it out um, get the district to sign that information and provide it to the two homeowners association right and in other cases in d13 or adjacent uh, to d13 uh, specifically like the water plants when they were going to be really loud or when they were going to have a lot of cement trucks in the neighborhood we gave um, it, it as a courtesy they gave the neighbors the heads up and they just appreciated that and that's that's the kind of thing that i would like to see DISD do with with the adjacent neighbors through the homeowners association, for example. Yeah, I think we can work that out. That's great. Well, please send me emails. Um, um, I, I want to hear what you think, and um, it's important, and uh, try and address the concerns to the extent we can. And can you repeat your email once again? Yes, it is um, CPC dash d13 at dallas city hall.com cpc stands for you know city plan commissioner dash the district number d is in dog 13 at dallas city hall.com can i throw out one more question right. the neighborhood just as a last thing i know we've just uh announced that the contractor's been hired which just shocks me that we would go through all of this to you know, it's like a foregone conclusion. And I guess I am just offended for our neighborhood that, that it has gone that far. I understand hiring an architect. I understand having to do this because next is zoning. But for it to be such a foregone conclusion that this is going to happen um, beyond us hiring legal counsel, because a lot of our neighbors are considering that, is there any other chance through the normal avenues of standing in front of Ms. Murphy, your team, and our neighbors pleading their case as to all of these reasons why, is there still a chance that they can appeal to your commissioner board to change this outcome? Just throw. Of course, you're welcome to come in and voice your opinion at the public hearing. Um, and I think um, the commission will be bound by what um, I'm sure legal will, will chime in and let us know the things that we can and cannot consider. It's the best I can do to answer your question. Thank you. It is seven uh, seven thirty now. Um, so just to respect everybody's time, um, thank you so much for joining this meeting. This has been um, great um, sharing. And again, we will put all the, the recording of this meeting of the, a copy of the presentation and other information on the bond 2015 page. So, so please visit that uh, in the next few days and we will have that information there. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you to 
um, Councilwoman Gates, to Ms. Murphy and everyone else, to um, Dr. Flo, everyone else who was here with us today. And uh, with that, we will end the meeting. Thank you. Have Thank you. a great evening. Thank you, everyone.